Welcome to Money Matters TV. I'm your host, Patty Tuadros. My co-host today is Paul Mitchell. And if you think there's something interesting to talk about, it's Bitcoin. And we are super excited, at least I am, to learn all about it, right? Sure, absolutely, yeah. yeah. New, new uh, financial uh, instrument. Yes, yeah. But before we get there, yeah. I was just on a panel mm -hmm. with the founder of Saxby's and a couple oh, yeah. other people. Yeah. Sure, sure. And we talked about failing and how businesses fail. Ah, but you don't ah. fail and stay there. You fail. They mm -hmm. called it failing forward. The ah, library hosted ah. it. Oh, instead of leaning forward, it's yeah, failing, failing forward. forward. And then falling forward. And yeah. I guess we'll have all, all, all kinds of themes uh, that ilk. <laughs> yeah, oh, that was really fascinating. So uh -huh. we all talked about our failures in our businesses yeah, and yeah. how you yeah. move I remember forward. I remember reading about uh, his failure or his bankruptcy, I think it was, or something like that uh, some, some years ago. The Saxby's guy? Yeah. Do you know he's like 30-ish years old? Mm -hmm. And he's told us that he had $150,000 in credit card debt. That's how he financed yeah. Saxby's. Wow. wow, yeah. Well, yeah. what's the downside? You know, they're not going to take your house. Just, no. credi just credit cards. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> he said that a private equity, I think it was a private equity firm, came in and kind of basically bailed him out. Yeah. Financially. Yeah, yeah. yeah. There was some, some kind of uh, error or mistakes were made or something like that, but he wasn't, uh, I guess, deemed to be um, personally or business-wise uh, solely responsible for, for what happened. Oh, I guess I don't know what you're talking about. Well, anyway. Now I'm going to go this, look this it some, up. Some, some years ago, I'm sure you could find the story, yeah. yeah. I was in another coffee shop uh, a couple of weeks ago, and uh, I saw another uh, founder as a, like, of uh, La Colomba coffee shops. Oh, he's really a fun person yeah, to Mr. listen Mr. Adventure, to. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I, I looked at him. He was talking to somebody else, and very, ca very casually dressed, you know, work shirt and jeans type of thing. And I kind of said, uh, I looked him up on the Internet, and saw his picture there. I said, yeah, it kind of looks like him and stuff. And <laughs> I got to hear him speak a few different times through networking groups I attend, and mm -hmm. it's really amazing. I mean, he just went for it. And I think, I wonder if he had any failures along the way. Yeah, he yeah. did tell us that he was roasting the coffee at the uh -huh. 19th Street location, yeah. and everything was cool. They were venting the the grinds, the mm -hmm. smell up mm -hmm. and out until mm -hmm. a a new development went up across the street or a renovation, and huh. the smell started going in. Oh boy! And they got in trouble. I think that was the story, something along uh -huh. that line. Uh -huh. But you know that thing about the coffee shops. You know, we were talking about it on uh, another show about some of these uh, businesses that uh, seem to be over in oversupply. I think it was. Uh, the yeah. uh, surgical centers, docking the, I call them, uh, docking the, um, docking the spot, docking the, uh, docking a box, docking a box, docking exactly. A box. That every corner seems to have them. Well, look at coffee shops. How could uh, another coffee shop chain find space yeah. in, you know, whether it's you know, Starbucks or X Y Z, you know, coffee company and you know A B C coffee company, and yet another one comes in and people finance it and say, oh, it's a great growth uh, business. Beats the heck out of me. You know, the, the big chain Starbucks, mm -hmm. I think that's the, I saw one close to Point Breeze and I thought, wow, they really, they made it. When you're getting a Starbucks in uh, proximal to your neighborhood, <laughs> then yeah, you, yeah, yeah. you're in. And what's interesting is those neighborhoods before that, they had some neighborhood, neighborhood coffee shop, nice coffee shop, not, part of, so? not part of a big chain, had, you know, has a lot more ambiance to it and that type of thing. But then you get the big chain comes in. Tough, tough competition. Yeah, tough there's, competition. A, there's a few roasters here in the city that I think are just mm -hmm. amazing, and I, I wish they'd open another one closer to my office. So yeah. <laughs> I'm sure they will. will it'll, it'll, it'll pop up in a corner. <laughs> <laughs> one day soon. Yeah, well, they'll be traveling uh, mobile, uh, instead of food trucks, they'll be coffee trucks. Yeah. I'm sure they must have them in Seattle or, or someplace like that. Yeah. I, don't, I don't understand why they don't have decaf coffee at night, <laughs> at, in the evenings. Mm. These are these are mysteries that will have to be explored. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, this is also our mystery guest, so uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, <should laughs> we'll still come back to you. Still a mystery. Oh, okay, still a mystery. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, still a mystery. What other kinds of businesses uh, do you th your, that your clients are getting into uh, that uh, seem to be um, interested in growth growth oriented? Hmm. I feel like our my clients are in the same space. A lot of industrial clients. Uh, Industrial, I mean manufacturer widgets? Manufacturers. Manufacturers uh -huh. of widgets, yeah. Okay. Well, that's great because a lot of people say that manufacturers die in this country. It's going away. You know, the scary question with this client is that some of their stuff is from China, but they engineer it in the United States. Mm -hmm. A lot of times they assemble it in the United States. Mm -hmm. But no product is, well, hardly anything is made in the United States exclusively. 
everybody's going to source products from all over the world mm -hmm. to put it together. Well, that makes sense. But then I see it on their social media where people will say, oh, where is it made? And they mm -hmm. get on their high horse, only yeah. buying American made. And I think, mm -hmm. are you delusional? Like, where do you think these parts are coming from? Yeah. Yeah. Did you ever see that in the, the banking industry where people didn't want to finance foreign countries coming in and like Chinese investors or? Well, only those countries that were involved in apartheid, if I say it correctly, apartheid. Apartheid. Apartheid, exactly. Where, for example, the city of Philadelphia passed a, a regulation, city council passed a regulation, the city will not do any business, will not tolerate any business with uh, that country or those countries. Wow, I didn't know that. Yeah, in fact, I even had a, um, here's an interesting situation. I had a, a customer a small customer that um, wasn't a manufacturer, it was a distributor, and they were buying the uh, from various sources. One of the sources was South Africa. Well, in order to you know buy foreign products and, and deal internationally, typically you have to put up a letter of credit. Not a problem. You put up the cash to the bank. The bank issues a letter of credit right. for that amount, et cetera, et cetera. Well, since it's against the law for any business in Philadelphia to deal with that country, no bank, no American bank. We should let her credit. <laughs> wow. So they searched around, and at the time, there was a Israeli bank in town that... Didn't care? It wasn't, wasn't against the law. Right, Put for it that them. way. Right. So they, they provided a letter of credit uh, for, that, for that customer. So that, um, yeah, it could very, um, very, very complex and very, very, it could very political, sure. Sure. That's really interesting. I Serbia, I mean, you know, th if the, the federal government says you can't deal with Serbia or, or Iran, there you go. And the sanctions, North Korea, you know, wh sanctions with Russia, sanctions here, sanctions there. Well, it's interesting because Philly is a sanctuary city that they would care about any laws that block out other countries. Politics, so. politics, politics. Yeah. So it, makes it can make it difficult on, on small businesses. More regulations they have to deal with. You know, what happened to just plain free trade? That's true. So I have a question from our audience, mm -hmm. and I think uh, well, I'll ask you now because it's something I'm interested in talking about. So this is from Robert Abel in Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. What do you think about using a reverse mortgage to fund a business venture? Yeah, wow. It's a, it's a, it's a very good question. It's, it's, uh, it's, good. it's a creative question. The, um, the answer is really is that it's very complex, a lot more complex than it looks on the surface and you're told about, and so you've really got to do your homework not just listen to one spiel, talk to different, I would say, you know, three or four different suppliers of reverse mortgages, go on the internet, try to get other perspectives, uh, maybe talk to some attorneys that have some experience with it, how it, how it works, et cetera. So in terms of very simplis uh, simplistically, how does a reverse mortgage work? Well, you have equity in your home, you work out a reverse mortgage with the provider of the reverse mortgage, they give you either a lump sum cash, which sounds like what you're talking about, so you can invest in your business, or they can agree to provide you monthly checks, sort of reverse of you making a mortgage payment. Now, let's just get talk about an example. Let's say your, your home is worth $300,000. It does have to be your primary residence. Okay, it cannot be a second home. Um, you get $200,000 as a reverse mortgage for it. You can take that in a lump sum, you invest in the business. Okay, so now, there's $200,000 reverse mortgage against your property. What if the property falls in value to $190,000? Guess what? Who cares? The way the thing works, you're not affected at all. You know, if, 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 you, uh, if you own a home or a business and the collateral value falls below the amount of the loan, <laughs> you, get, you really have a problem, but not in a reverse mortgage. So it's safe that way. Now, of course, um, the reverse mortgage um, is, is in place until you die or no longer have it as a, as a principal residence or, or, or move out, okay? So these are some of the complexities. And of course, that, that dollar amount that you borrowed against it, if it was $200,000, is gonna still be $200,000. Your only real obligations, f financial obligations, once you take out the reverse mortgage, is that you have to maintain the property, pay the taxes, pay the insurance. But other than that, it kind of uh, remains static. So, um, so check into it, um, and, you know, and make sure you understand the, you know, how it works, and uh, run different scenarios of how about this? What if this? What if you take out the money? What if your business fails? Okay, well, you've got a home then that, you know, doesn't have much equity in it. Are you going to live there? Are you stay there? Are you going to try to sell it? Give it back to the mortgage holder, or whatever. So 
that's what I would do is uh, you know, get some advisors, um, talk to maybe some uh, consumer credit um, counselors would be also uh, good ideas because it's a form of debt. Uh, but it, it's complex. It had some bad um, connotations to it a number of years ago. There were some uh, people that were a little uh, fast talking, I guess. And um, since it's, it's, it's oriented toward situations where there's a good amount of equity in a home, a lot of those homeowners are elderly people. And elderly people frequently don't have the, the best um, uh, concepts of uh, uh, complicated uh, financial situations and, and they tend to trust people without checking things out. So my main advice is check it out, run by some uh, scenarios with um, people that know about it. And even the best thing to do would be to even find some people that have had reverse mortgages for five or 10 years. How's it working for them? So thanks for the question. All right, and if you have questions here to help us send them in. You can have your questions answered on Money Matters. Please go to our website, money-matterstv.com. On our homepage, click on the banner on the right that says, send us your questions. While you're on our website, you can find information about our hosts and guests, as well as show notes and links about this show and past shows. Money Matters is also available as a podcast on iTunes and Stitcher, so you can listen to Money Matters while you're on the go. That website address, again, is money, M-O-N-E-Y, dash matters, M-A-T-T-E-R-S, TV dot com. And now you're going to meet our official guest, officially. <laughs> <laughs> this is Jack Tater, who is the CEO of GEM Research Solutions. And I know you're going to talk to us about Bitcoin and I other am. things. And, and other things. things. Right. So maybe you could start up by telling us about your, your firm. Yes, uh, my firm is GEM Research Solutions. We are actually a market research provider. We've been specializing in the financial industry for the last 20 years. Prior to being with the firm, I was actually a financial consultant with a major uh, wealth management firm and did that for nearly a decade. So I've worked with a lot of clients mm -hmm. dealing with their financial matters and financial future. And then we work with uh, the major financial service companies, pretty much all of them, uh, to work with them on research that they do with clients, investors, new products, advertising, and all of those types of things. So. I've I've seen a lot in the financial industry over mm -hmm. the last 25, 30 years. All right, and now you're focused on Bitcoin. Well, focus, <laughs> focus, <laughs> I kind want of. It to be. <laughs> niche, niche, a niche. <laughs> it, An interest. Well, it's very interesting. It kind of grew out of research that we were doing. And I actually had a client come to me, I would say probably around five years ago. Mm -hmm. And they said, you know, we're interested in Bitcoin, finding out about Bitcoin. So at the time, uh, I worked with some people in my firm and said, let's look into Bitcoin, find some things out about it. And I had a person in the firm, his name was Ryan Lancelot. He went and did some research and he came back to me with about an 80 page document of research on this. Wow. And it proved to be so thorough and informative that I did some work with it and he and I jointly published a book called What's the Deal with Bitcoin? Hmm. Which was one of the first books out about Bitcoin and got us very interested in the whole Bitcoin world. Now this was, about five years ago. Did you bring us books? <laughs> <laughs> you can actually get a free, f it's, it's actually free. available for free <laughs> online and okay. maybe we can tell about that later on. Uh, but it's actually very interesting because back five years ago, Bitcoin was trading in the dollars, single dollars. Well, tell us what Bitcoin is. I know sure. not everyone knows. Sure, Bitcoin is a digital currency and it is built on an infrastructure which is known as the blockchain. So many people have been talking about the blockchain and, and how that works. And maybe I don't talking, know what that is. What is a yeah, blockchain? Yeah, maybe talking about the blockchain mm -hmm. first. It's actually a distributed network. So if you think about computers all over the world, mm -hmm. they're all running this software, this Bitcoin software. And on their computers, they're running the software. And what happens is if there's a transaction, so let's say I give to you one Bitcoin. Uh, on the network, it would have to be confirmed by the different nodes on the network. And this confirmation occurs on the network. And for those computers that confirm the transaction, and all they're really doing is running software that is actually running an algorithm, a formula in the background. Mm -hmm. And when it, when it confirms that transaction, that computer writes that confirmation to a permanent ledger. And for doing that, they receive a Bitcoin a reward, a hash reward. 
So that's how mining for Bitcoin is done, by running this computer software on your computer, and it's run in a distributed network. And then the transaction is automatically written to a permanent ledger that's kept on every single one of those nodes. So that's a, block, that's a blockchain. So the Bitcoin that's earned can then be used, and initially when it was first created, it was used by programmers to pay each other for doing certain tasks. Like a, like a barter from 500 years ago. Exactly. So very it's literally very not money. It, well, it, it was not money. It was, it was kind of this you know, digital currency that people mm -hmm. transferred uh, to each other. When it became tradable on exchanges, so in essence, someone could take $10 and mm -hmm. say, I'm going to now buy a Bitcoin. Once it did that and translated back to a dollar value, to our fiat currency, now it had a value. And now it, in essence, was an investment. And since that time, it now trades 24 hours a day, seven days a week worldwide. And it is now trading, I think today, uh, it's at a uh, all-time high of, I think it was over fifteen hundred dollars. I'd Bitcoin. like to know you to know that this is recorded, and you offered me a Bitcoin earlier. <laughs> 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 I've said yes. I thought a few Bitcoins. You said. <laughs> uh, so how it is. It, it is rather amazing. How did it become worth so much money? Why is it worth so much? Well, it it is a form of currency between individuals, and like I said, because you can, you can transfer a dollar or a number of dollars and buy a Bitcoin, uh, it becomes an investment. Now, Bitcoin can go to eight decimal points. So if it goes all the way out to the, all the, way out to the end, it's called a Satoshi, which is actually created, which is actually named after the creator of Bitcoin. So it can go all that way out there. So people can send point oh 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 one two Bitcoins to someone, and that could be equal to three dollars or something along those lines. So it becomes a value when you can buy goods for it. Now you don't go, you've talked about coffee shops before, you can't really go to too many coffee shops <laughs> and use Bitcoin. Yeah. Uh, but the reality is there are some coffee shops that are taking Bitcoin. How do you pay with Bitcoin at a terminal? Uh, you have a address. Everyone has a unique address and you basically say I'm going to take Bitcoin from my address and give it to your address. And it's automatically done, and there's a very small transaction cost, much less than a credit card cost. Oh. So that's one, that's one way that it's become very appealing for people, is because there's this not a 3% charge. So it's a much lower percentage. Then you think about internationally. You think about remittances. So the people that want to send money back to Mexico, let's say, for instance, Right now they use Western Union. Western Union has a 10% charge. So sending $100 back to family in Mexico, they would get $90. If you were to send $100 in Bitcoin back, they would get just about $100. So it solves a lot of remittances problems. Also, if you're unbanked, and a lot of millions and millions of people worldwide are unbanked, they can actually have a Bitcoin account without going through a bank as well. So there's a lot of different solutions that are potentially out there around Bitcoin as a digital currency. Is it is there any kind of s regulation? And number two, you talked about that ledger that's kept. Mm -hmm. Who audits that? I'm a banker. Right, <laughs> right, right. Well, that's one of the interesting things about Bitcoin is Bitcoin, as I mentioned before, it's a distributed network. So there is no central authority. So some people may say, well, that's a concern because there's nobody keeping controls on mm -hmm. it. When in the reality, some people would also say, well, that's a good thing about it because there isn't a central authority. It's controlled by all the different, by the whole network. Mm -hmm. So the network always has a record of what's gone on. Well, it's transparent. All these transactions are transparent. Very, yes, exactly. Very transparent. So if one node goes down, mm -hmm. it doesn't matter because someone else has the legend. And, and because of that, then uh, uh, illegal transfers of money, for example, mm -hmm. that the gov our government is so concerned about, well, it's so transparent, it wouldn't be effective to do transfers of $100 million to uh, war-torn countries or something like that um, because it's, it's transparent. Oh, so I'm sure they it, can hide that, can't Well, they? Y yes, they're, they're it actually, because every transaction is recorded, it's recorded with an address. That address 
may not be obviously associated with you. Ah. So that address is, is a numeric, okay. numeric number. However, that being said, because that transaction is recorded, there's been a lot of forensic work that's been done. And anytime there's been a major hack of Bitcoin, which has never occurred on the blockchain, it's only occurred in exchanges that are storing Bitcoin off of the blockchain. But whenever there's been a hack, they have been able to track it back to the person who has been able, who did the hack, for the most part. So because of that, yes, there's a lot of work to be done, but you can actually, it's, it's, it's not an anonymous system, it's a pseudonymous system, meaning that you have this code which mm. looks anonymous, but it actually mm. has a computer associated with it. So they've been actually able to track it down. So there is this ability to track to track down whenever there's hacks. So, so who doesn't want to see Bitcoins exist? Who wants to put the Bitcoin concept out of business? Well, it, I would I would see it as potentially a threat to government currencies. Uh, oh, it would replace the euro, the dollar, the pound. Right, and and yeah. I don't and I don't think it's looking to replace that. I think it's looking at being a supplemental uh, form of currency, just as we have different currencies in different countries. I mean, we have mm -hmm. the dollar here, but in other countries they have other currencies as well. So I don't think it's looking to replace it. I think it's an it's actual it's a currency that can benefit transactions that are done globally, and and I've been a big proponent of looking into regulation and taking a look at it. And I may fall uh, as a on the wrong side of this with many Bitcoin people who don't want to see any regulation. Right. However, my thought is there are so many good benefits to it, and as an investment vehicle that it does require some sort of regulation. Yeah, how can you advise your clients to invest in something that is unregulated that maybe become wild or whatever? Right, I, I, I agree with you. And, and one recent example of that was because Bitcoin, Bitcoin has grown so much and it has become an investment vehicle, there was actually uh, recently an ETF that was proposed, an exchange traded mm -hmm. fund, as you're aware, uh, by the Winklevoss twins. Remember from the social network? Remember oh, the rowers? Yeah. yeah. So, so they're very big in Bitcoin. So they filed with the SEC to have an ETF with the thinking that, okay, this would be an easy way for people to invest in mm -hmm. Bitcoin because Bitcoin does have a place, I think, in people's portfolio. Maybe we can talk about that. But to do it in an ETF manner. And the SEC took a hard look at it and they actually came back and they denied that. that they're since re-looking at it. But they denied it for, for a lot of the points that you brought up. There's no regulatory, centralized regulatory mm -hmm. environment, and there are some concerns. It's so new out there. Yeah. But the reality is that there are some investment vehicles where you can invest in Bitcoin as well that fall outside of an ETF. So I think it's only a matter of time before it becomes as a, more of a mainstream investment vehicle. Mm -hmm. So Bitcoin, now that it's worth around $1,500 a sh for one Bitcoin, mm -hmm. Is it like a stock? Like if I bought a Bitcoin today for 1500 and viewed it as an investment, hoping it would go up higher, mm -hmm. I can lose my money at the same time? Oh, without a doubt. Yeah. I mean, it is, it, is, it, it, it is a high risk investment. And I've done a lot of writing on this topic. And as being a financial consultant and being someone who's worked with people in their retirement, I always come back to how do you design a portfolio? Mm -hmm. And I tell people who are looking to invest in it, that it shouldn't be something that you look at when you invest in stocks, but rather look at it as, as an alternative investment. Mm -hmm. And many times there are portfolios that have 50% in stocks, 30% in bonds, and 20% in alternative investments. So when that happens, that's a place where Bitcoin like, can like fit other in. Other alternative investments might be gold or hedge funds oh, okay. or uh, venture capital right. or even real estate. Things, because the real estate is not, not very liquid. Right. You know, if you buy a, a bi office building tomorrow and you say, "Well, I need a hundred thousand bucks," you can't sell it the next day. Okay. And the whole and the whole point with alternative investments is because it's non-correlated to the stock market. So it became very popular after the crash of two thousand eight mm -hmm. because people said, "Well, if the whole market goes down. Is there something I can invest in that that isn't correlated to it?" Gold kind of fit that. Mm -hmm. And now when you take a look at the correlation between stocks and Bitcoin, there is that non-correlation there. So Bitcoin does fit a model, I believe, as an alternative investment. That being said, people should invest more than, let's say, 5 to 10% of their portfolio 
into Bitcoin or other assets mm. similar to that. Mm. But it can be an investment to help out people to achieve what they need to achieve in their portfolio. Have you, have you bought and sold things with Bitcoin? I have, I have. Yeah. I actually even have a credit card that uh, allows me to go into anywhere that accepts a visa and it will actually, instead of taking, instead of debiting out of my bank account, it actually debits out of my uh, Bitcoin mm -hmm. account. So I'm actually, I can actually buy just about anything with, uh, with Bitcoin because of this credit card. But one of the other things that many people have done with Bitcoin is they buy Bitcoin and then they go on to these exchanges uh, in which they can buy and sell five to 600 other types of crypto assets. So it's not just Bitcoin. Yeah. There is this whole Bit asset I, class. I saw that word in your write-up. The uh, crypto asset. I thought it was. I thought it was uh, Syro. I thought it was like the frozen something. <laughs> crypto. Crypto. <laughs> cryptography. Right. 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 So there are actually five <laughs> to six hundred of these additional assets that are out there, beyond just Bitcoin, that so are actually being traded. Mm -hmm. I know you're not a security cybersecurity expert, but let's just talk briefly. When sure. someone a hospital network gets taken over mm -hmm. or an office building, their their computers get hacked. And then the people want to get paid in Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. Can they call the FBI then instead of paying it and saying, like, can they track them that quickly? Well, I, I think they should call the FBI. Uh, right. It all depends on what they're losing. I mean, that's, that's a decision they have to make. But remember, there's ransoms made for everything. Cash, with pallets of cash, or pallets whatever, of cash. Or whatever. Yeah. So you know the ransoms that are that are made with many different things. And in fact, if if they ransom with money or a sack of money, that's probably uh, less less easy to track than Bitcoin. Because once again, remember that every Bitcoin transaction uh, has a fingerprint on the ledger, and with enough work and enough expertise, they can track who did it. So yes, there are those types of things that are going on. Uh, and Bitcoin has been kind of the uh, the, the currency of, of preferred currency. preferred <laughs> currency for those types of things. But it's been happening with other types of currency as well. But the reality is is that they can be tracked back with enough hard work because of the way the transactions are recorded. That's what I find fascinating about it. I didn't realize it was trackable because you watch all those TV shows where there's seven layers of, you know, they mirrored accounts and hid their identity. And I think, oh, those people that are doing ransomware, they must be pretty smart. But well, they are. They are very smart. Yeah. And, and I make it sound like they can find them. It's a lot of hard work and potentially they may not find all of them uh, or they're in some hovel in Eastern Europe or something like that. I don't know. But yeah, it's, yeah. Uh, th there, are some, there, there are some concerns about doing that. Mm -hmm. And that's, like I said, just been yeah. the currency. Well, well, Jack, would you say this is the biggest investment opportunity since the internet? I, I think it is. I uh -huh. think it is. And I mentioned before about the five to 600 other assets that are out there. Mm -hmm. The reality is, is that because of the blockchain, because of the way Bitcoin was created, this has allowed other coins, so to speak, other coins or assets, what we call crypto assets, to be formed. And these assets are now funding companies. Hmm. If you were to take a look at this and, and follow this, there are actually people who are creating businesses and rather than raising money through an IPO, they're doing it through something called an ICO, an initial coin offering. So rather than offering stock, they're actually offering coins. That's really fascinating. I really would love to keep talking about it, but unfortunately our show's gonna have to wrap up. But uh, we look forward to visiting your website and learning more about it and people can reach out to you Great. through oh. there. Well, how would they find uh, Jack? If well, they what is to? your web address? Well, you can go to uh, my address at uh, safe4retirement.com. That's safe and the number four, retirement.com. Uh, but I'll also put a plug in that uh, I have a book coming out in October that I co-authored uh, with Chris Berniski. That's available. You can take a look at it for pre-order if you go to bitcoinandbeyond.com. Okay. And it's available on Amazon and it's called Crypto Assets. Okay. Thank Thanks, you. Thanks, Jack. Fascinating. Uh -huh. A whole nother world. Yes. yes. All right. Well, that's the end of our show. We thank you for joining us and hope you'll come back soon because as my co-host likes to say, your money matters.